الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه Brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I introduce to you the Prophet Idris عليه السلام and we talked a little bit about him there's not much about him in our Quran and Sunnah and even in Israelite tradition we don't have too much about Idris السلام. in biblical terms if you want to know he is called Enoch E-N-O-C-H and in the Quran he is Idris السلام. he lived he was born about 250 years before the death of Prophet Adam السلام. He lived a little bit of the time of Adam السلام. And when Adam السلام, died and Sheath, his Prophet son died, Idris السلام, took over. And we spoke about his mission and how he came with a new Sharia. He was the first where he commanded Jihad fi sabilillah, which is to fight off and ward off evil but this time needing to take up arms against the corrupted people of Qabil who were also getting used to killing. And we said that zina, adultery and fornication had become widespread. We spoke about uh, Idris alayhi salam, that he was the first, it is narrated, that he is the first to have uh, wrote with the pen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does say in the Qur'an الَّذِي عَلَّمَ بِالْقَلَمِ Allah is the one that taught man with the pen. And what this means is that we write and we preserve information, knowledge, history and pass it on from generation to generation. Idris alayhi salam was a tall man. He was approximately the same height as Adam alayhi uh, salam. 50 to 60 dhura. Dhura means the Arab turns from the elbow to the end of your finger. That's one dhura. He was about 50 to 60. Adam alayhi salam was 60 of him. And he was a very handsome man, Idris alayhi salam. He was broad shouldered. He was very wise. When he walked, he had long strides. He'd look at the ground a lot, which shows us that he was a man who thought a lot, he pondered a lot. He didn't waste his time. Idris alayhi salam had beautiful eyes. Mukahalatain, as in the hadith, it says mukahalatain, it's like as if they had a kuhul in them, like a mascara type in them. Because he had long eyelashes, thick eyelashes, desert eyes, sallallahu alayhi salatu wasalam. And Idris had a slight, what we say in Arabic, absa. Absa is like a frown, but not an ugly frown, not, a, not an angry frown. It's a type of frown that looked like he was sad, reminiscing all the time, reminiscing. Sad, a kind of a sad face, beautiful, yet sad face, which means he always cared. Idris alayhi salam, he fought off the people of Qabil, and managed by the will of Allah to stop them from their corruption, from murder, from the spread of adultery and fornication. And remember what the Prophet وسلم, Muhammad وسلم, told us in the Sahih Hadith, which is in Bukhari and Muslim. He said that no generation that comes and starts to normalize adultery and fornication Fahisha means dirty sexual acts. They normalize it and it becomes public and widespread except that new diseases and sicknesses and pain will start to appear in them that did not appear in the generations before. Today we have the likes of HIV and AIDS, STDs, sexually transmitted diseases and infections as a result of putting it simply for us to, to learn anything that was that is haram to do any sexual haram because the only time it's halal is in marriage and science today many studies have been done i talked about this topic in perth you can it's a bit on youtube as well that 
um, they advise people not to have multiple partners, random multiple partners. Um, many men sleep with many women and vice versa. And uh, they also said, and this is a fact, that the most people at risk from HIV and AIDS and STDs are the men who practice homosexuality. And really, when Allah has forbidden something for us, it's only to protect us from it, because then we receive deadly circumstances. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us pure and protected and save us. My brothers and sisters in Islam, Idris alayhi salam, he fought them up, he had to take up arms even, because they took up arms, and they were stopped. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed for Idris alayhi salam to come to an end of his life. Idris alayhi salam, he, uh, he lived to, to approximately 900 years. 900 years, they used to live very long in those days. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam said, that people used to be very big in size and they used to live longer and then as time went on they got shorter and shorter and their lifespan became shorter and shorter and then he was asked what is the lifespan of your ummah of, of us and the Prophet ﷺ said ummati my, the lifespan of my ummah is approximately generally speaking on average between 60 and 70 years so this is us now, the last of generations of this world. Brothers and sisters in Islam, Idris alayhi salam did not actually die on earth. There is a hadith in Sahih Muslim and similar to it in Bukhari where the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, when he ascended to the heavens in the Isra al Ma'raj, he saw in the fourth heaven, he saw Idris alayhi salam. And this, and what I described you, what I describe him with to you today is exactly how the Prophet ﷺ described him. So I took it from the hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him. When he saw Idris salam, and they said salam to each other, he said, I saw my brother Idris. Because all the Prophets are brothers, they call each other brothers. But this brotherhood that the Prophets have is different to the brotherhood we have. It's the brotherhood of prophethood. And uh, he describes him this way. What happened to Idris salam is that uh, he was... He, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, took his soul in the heavens. Where in the heavens? Allah alam. Allah only knows. And remember, whenever you see the translation in the Quran, translation of the meaning, wherever the word heaven comes up, people assume that it's paradise, Jannah, that you go to. But it's not. Heaven just means sama, sky, uh, space, up and above. Heavens, Allahu Alam. Allah only knows the, the nature of these heavens. We are yet to even discover what's beyond us, even just slightly beyond our solar system or our, 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 and our distant galaxies. So we don't know. We're still discovering many new things. So he was lifted. Allah says in the Quran, رَفَعْنَاهُ مَكَانًا عَلِيَّا In Surah Maryam, we lifted Idris to a high place. And Ibn Abbas and others, the Prophet's companions, best of Mufassirs they are, in and also in the book Tafsir of Kathir, he says that uh, he was lifted by an, he was lifted he was he died in a in a fourth heaven above. Now there are narrations which are fabricated, and some of them are very weak. We don't know where they came from, and some ulama assume that they were Israelite traditions because they do believe in Idris alayhi salam that he wanted to visit the heavens. Idris wanted to see up above and beyond, and Allah sent to him an angel. And this angel has wings. We know in the Quran Allah says that some angels, they have wings. Mathna, two wings, four wings, and many wings. Jibreel has 600 wings. And Idris said to this angel, take me up into the heavens. And he took him up. And when he reached the fourth heaven, he met with the angel of death. And the angel of death, uh, he came to take his soul out. And the, the, the other angel says to him, I'm, I just want to show him the heavens and bring him back. He said, subhanAllah, how strange is that God told me to take his soul in the fourth heaven. And I wondered how am I going to take a son in the fourth heaven when he's on earth. And so this, and so he died in the fourth heaven. Now this what I just said is not reliable, but just in case he came across it, these are just stories of the Israelite traditions. And what did we say last time about Israelite traditions? The Prophet ﷺ told us, you can read and talk about Israelite traditions as much as you want. That's okay, no problem with that. 
reading the old scriptures of the Jews and the Christians, that's fine. They're the Israelites. The Jews and the Christians are the Israelites. But the Israel are the children of Yaqub, Prophet Yaqub salam, Jacob, from whom Yusuf salam, was born and other prophets. So Yaqub salam, is Israel. And from him came the Jews and the Christians of today. So we're allowed to read their scriptures and learn from them. And he said, however, whatever, but do not, he said, do not confirm or deny. Don't believe it. This hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. Do not believe what they say, but don't also deny what they say. And he said, instead you should say, if you come across Israeli traditions that are not in the Quran, they're not in hadiths, in the Sunnah, we don't know about them. And very importantly, brothers and sisters, so long as they do not oppose any of our beliefs in the Quran. Prophet used to say, so long as they do not oppose the teaching of the Quran, then hadithu, talk about it as much as you want, read about it, do not say it's true and do not say it's a lie, and just say, Allah knows best, we believe in whatever came down from Allah. So that, if it was true, you believe in it came down from Allah. If it wasn't, you say we only believe what came down from Allah, therefore, if it didn't come down from Him, you haven't lied. So brothers and sisters, we believe in anything that came down from Allah in the Israelite traditions before it was uh, manipulated and edited and changed, a lot of their scriptures and, and, and wordings, we believe in what still exists that came down from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And really, uh, Islam is the only religion which acknowledges beliefs of uh, other religions. And when they talk about harmony and uh, living in, in integrating uh, uh, with conditions, of course, integration is not giving up your ideals and your principles, but integrating and living in harmony with other people of different religions and the religion of peace and tranquility, Truly, when people study it, you see. When you study Islam, you see that. Not when you read rubbish stuff off the internet or some wacko Muslim comes and talks strange things or an ignorant person speaks stuff. No. So when you study Islam, you find that we are the most tolerant of all religions in the world, of other religions. Tolerant of, sorry, of, of the followers of other religions. We don't tolerate false beliefs, but what we mean is that we tolerate its people. They have the right to believe what they want, and we can live with them in harmony, trade and eat and marry from the Jews and Christians. The men, of course, can marry from the Jews and Christian women. That's another topic. And uh, we can live in harmony. We have this for over a thousand years the Muslims lived, and many Jews and Christians testify this. In fact, more Jews testify to the fact that they lived with Muslims for over a thousand years in harmony. And the Jews I'm talking about are the 80% of Jews of the world, and we have no problem with. The, the Jews that we have a problem with, and I want to emphasize this to a lot of the Muslims, because we're brought up thinking Jews, all Jews are bad. No, the Zionist Jews have an extreme and dangerous belief of killing and murdering. And there are Jews themselves who stand up more than Muslims and Palestinians themselves, whether they are in the US or UK or anywhere, against this. You can see some Jews, what are they doing? They burn the Israeli flag themselves, opposing the belief of the Zionists, the extremist Zionists, the fanatics of their own. So brothers and sisters, do not mistake Jews to Zionists. We have no problem with Jews. But the Zionists, we have a problem with them and their belief because they are there too. With their belief is to wipe out the, anyone who sits in, in Jerusalem, they're going to take it over, whether by force or killing women, children or men. You know the story. So now we come back to the end of the story with Idris alayhi salam. That's all that's really mentioned in Surah Maryam about Idris alayhi salam, a few things from the Prophet alayhi salam. Up to this point, brothers and sisters, nobody had worshipped idols, Nobody had worshipped anyone other than Allah. Still, up to this point, all of them were still Muslim. Now the word Muslim is what? Submitters to the command of Allah. So long as you do not make partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any, in, your, in any way, shape or form, you are a Muslim. And you say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, with its conditions. La ilaha illallah has conditions, believe in Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi has conditions then, which is not doing shirk in any way, shape or form, then you are a Muslim. You could be a sinful Muslim, you could be a murdering Muslim, you could be all types of Muslims, right? You can be all these types of Muslims, all these corrupted Muslims. The only thing which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forgive on the day of judgment, like if you died and you were committing shirk, making partners with Allah in any way, shape or form, and you hadn't repented yet, you died on that, on the Day of Judgment, 
you will see other people, all their sins may be forgiven. Maybe. Maybe the adulterers will be forgiven. Maybe the murderers can be forgiven. Allah forgives whoever He wills. He knows who deserves it. Except for the person who died, knowing that they were doing shirk, knowing they were doing shirk, and they continued to do shirk. Knowing that they were doing shirk, and they continued to do shirk. On the day of judgment, they will never be forgiven. Allah said in the Quran, Inna Allah, inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bihi. Allah will never forgive that a person associates partners with him. This is on the day of judgment, not in this world. On the day of judgment, if you die with that. وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ But Allah may forgive for anything other than that, of any sin, for whomever He wills. Whomever He deems deserving. But on a day of judgment, shirk is not forgiven. And therefore, we as Muslims, and also Christians and Jews believe this, at least Christians in the Bible, the Qur'an tells us that anyone on the day of judgment who had major shirk, died with major shirk, then they will never enter paradise, ever, eternal entrance into hellfire. Knowingly, they knew this and they did it. As for those who didn't know or never received the message, well Allah SWT says in the Qur'an, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا We will never punish a people or a person until we have sent them a messenger. Who are these people who received the messenger? Who got it? Who didn't get it? This is only known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can't say who it is. On the day of judgment, Allah will deal with them in a just way because Allah's name is Al Adil, which means the fair and the just. So He knows. This is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do our mission, what we can. You look after yourself so long as you know and you're doing the right thing. Allah says in the Quran, O people, worry about yourselves at the end of the day. Give da'wah. Teach people, but at the end of the day, worry about yourself that you are following the right guidance. Those who are misguided cannot harm you if you are rightly guided. My brothers and sisters, this is what I'm to say about that. Uh, Allah says, uh, those who called gods beside Allah, was those who re rejected the message of Allah, was anha, and they were filled with pride and arrogance against it. So they, they rejected it knowingly with pride and arrogance. لا تفتح لهم أبواب السماء. The the heavens, the doors of the heavens will never open up for them. They will never be able to go through them. ولا يدخلون الجنة. And they will never enter paradise. حتى يلج الجمل في سم الخياط. Until the camel can enter through the tiny, to the tiny, through the tiny notch of a needle. You know the needle thread that you that you sew with. You know that little notch that you put the you put the string through. Can barely see it. We have trouble putting the string through. Isn't that correct? Allah says, when the camel, the big camel, enters through that notch, through that hole, that's when the person who disbelieved in Allah's message will enter paradise. Stakbaru anha, meaning they took pride from them, they, they, they were full of pride. They rejected it and refused it knowingly after it came to them. As for those who didn't hear about it or know about it or maybe they didn't receive it in a proper way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deals with them in a different way on the day of judgment. He is the fair and the just. Brothers and sisters in Islam, so as I said, Tawheed, the oneness of Allah, monotheism, believing in one Allah and worshipping only one God, stayed for at least, at least 1,000 years and more. 1,000 years, the time of Adam alayhi salam, because Adam alayhi salam lived for 1,000 years. And another thousand years after him, Idris alayhi salam. When Idris alayhi salam died, a few hundred years passed, and subhanAllah, Allah did not send a prophet or a messenger in that time. No prophet, no messenger was needed. There were only righteous people who were carrying the message of the prophets before, who followed, like us, like what we are now. And they took the message of Idris and Adam, and they had scriptures that had written, and they followed the sharia of Enoch of Idris alayhi salam and people lived in Islam Allahu alam what the sharia was exactly how they prayed but they all bowed and prostrated in some way maybe three prayers I don't know maybe whenever they wanted but all of them bowed and prostrated prostration bowing has always been in, ever since man was alive and righteous people kept people intact and on the right track however man as Allah says jahud he forgets and denies. This is in our nature. We always need to be reminded. Sometimes in a harsh way, sometimes in an easy way, sometimes in a good way, sometimes silent, sometimes 
loud. Sometimes we need to be embarrassed. Sometimes we need to be woken up in some way. A tragedy may happen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps guiding the people. And Allah had promised Adam alayhi salam and Hawa that when he sent them down on earth, he told them, you shall be under my watchful eyes. I will look after you and I will continue to bring you guidance to your offspring. I won't leave you alone. And so his messengers and prophets started to be sent. However, these righteous people I told you about, everybody loved them. People honored them tremendously. When they died, somehow, five of them became the most popular righteous people, wise men. Christians, this is an innovation they made, never existed in their religion today, they bring out what they call saints. People of the past, who they considered were pious, they could have died hundreds of years ago, and then they say if they show two or three miracles, we call them a saint. In Arabic, we say wali. But wali is not the same as saint. All right? Wali is not a miraculous person. Could have been a person, and Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the wali. Many of you here, inshallah, could be a wali of Allah. But the way they believe in it is that they've got special miraculous uh, privileges above others. They are, they are divine. And what happened is that certain worship is attributed to them. Dua is made to them. In some Muslim worlds, they do that today. They do it towards saints, people who are righteous. There are graves in different parts of our world, in the Middle East, in Turkey, in India. A lot of this is in Pakistan. There's a lot of this where people build big shrines of people they considered righteous in the olden days. And subhanAllah, this is the action of the Buddhists and the Hindus, the Hindus especially. You know, we see it a lot happening among them. Uh, and what they do is they honor this, these graves to a point where they start worshiping them. Worship comes in all shapes and forms. So brothers and sisters in Islam, these five men, their names were, they are in the Quran. Wad, Suwa', Yahuth, Ya'uq, and Nasr. They are in Surah Nuh. And these five actually existed from them, from them came out idolatry, which made its way all the way, thousands of years later, into Mecca. Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu, the Prophet's cousin and companion, one of the greatest knowledgeable ones, Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu, and he is similar to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud in knowledge. Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu, when you hear about his name, know that he knows what he's saying. Because Prophet made dua for him to increase him in knowledge and wisdom. And this guy, this young man, Abdullah ibn Abbas, was only a teenager when he spoke these things. He said, uh, what these five idols, these five righteous men began, and people started worshipping them, and from them the idols of Mecca came into existence. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saw, he, he had to send another prophet. These people made this, how did it happen? This is where the shaitan comes in. He gives people ideas. Now what I'm about to say, a lot of people today in the West, Especially in the West, this is long gone. Even non-Muslims of the West, no matter what religion they are, and especially in the scientific era that we live in, the science era with atheism uh, out there, even though science and atheism don't go hand in hand, to be honest, but that's another story, I don't believe so. However, there's lots of the, the, the era of atheism and science where it's, it's become almost like a god to people. What happened is that they don't care about idolatry. They're long gone. This, this, is, this is ancient. Although over half the world is still practicing idolatry, in the West, idolatry is long gone. And it's very funny because instead of worshipping a statue or an idol, they've just changed the way they worship idols this day and age. And I'll come back to it. What happened here is that I want to show you how the shaitan. Shaitan doesn't care whether you worship a stone or a statue or yourself or it's some, some other form. He doesn't care what it is. So, so long as it falls into the category of shirk, he doesn't care. Shirk means going to hellfire for me. I don't care what it is. Suddenly he noticed that they loved these idols and he got an idea. The shaitan appeared in the form of a man. He started coming to these people who loved these righteous men and they said, why don't you make an anniversary every year where you remember these people? <laughs> You know, it's good da'wah. People remember righteous people. They remember what they left behind. So far, so good. Year after year, they started to commemorate their death. 
Then another generation came where their ignorance got worse. And Shaitan said, why don't you like build statues out of them so that people can remember them even more? And the people build statues, they said, what a great idea. And so they generate another generation passed, a hundred years or so, and the Shaitan then said, Your forefathers were very knowledgeable. Yes, they were. Who would have said my ancestry is really knowledgeable? Everybody stands to their ancestry, right? Your ancestry. They must have left these idols behind, these statues, for a reason. You should give them offerings to commemorate, like bring some food, put them there, or give them out in the names of these statues to honor them, and God will love you more because God loves them. So this idea was placed into them. And man takes it. Human beings take anything that sounds, I don't know, obscure. SubhanAllah, when it comes to facts and, and things that, are, that make sense, a lot of human beings, as Allah says, <laughs> If you were to look at the world, the majority of people, even if you tried to look, to try and count them all, you, uh, he said, um, you will hardly find the majority being believers. The majority of them are misguided, SubhanAllah. And we have today, in the West, something called Western astrology, for example. Just giving you one example. All right, Scientology. <laughs> Great celebrities who are apparently supposed to be intelligent. They, they join with these people. And Western astrology is uh, the zodiac signs, if you ever heard of them, star signs. And subhanAllah, among our sisters and among our brothers even, but more the women, they, they go into this and they want to know which month they are born. And subhanAllah, how someone brought an idea by the way, the zodiac sign, what happened to it is that it started in Babylonian astrology thousands and thousands of years ago. And it is said in one narration that Nuh alayhi salam went, he, he called his people and committed idolatry in Babylonia actually. Different narrations, but it was around that area. It's interesting because the people of Qabil spread to Babylonia and they started off this idolatry. And the people of Babylonia today, there is a special sect who still mention Idris in a special way, right? He's something amazing, right? And from there came star signs that, you know, the sun rotates in a certain way, they say. It circulates it or, or moves in a certain way throughout the year, which is true, of course, science. And what happens is that it creates this, this circle of zodiacs, animals, animal-like creatures that are made up of the, the way the, the celestial, the, the, uh, the stars are, are positioned. And they name them after each month. You know, the Scorpio and, and, and Aries and uh, what is it? Cancer and I don't know what else. They name all these different names. And say so if you're born in this month, it affects your characteristic, right? Something about the energy that flows through the sun and the positioning of the stars. Uh, obviously, in science, there is no proof to that in science itself. But it's what you would call pseudoscience. It's a mix of science and beliefs, false beliefs, this is what they call pseudoscience, right? And they mix the two and then they suddenly they turn it into as if it's science. It's not, my brothers and sisters, this is idolatry. To believe in positioning of a star, that it tells you and determines your character and you live by it. To believe in that and give powers to certain positionings of the universe that it, it, it affects your character or, or it makes you into a certain thing and you're, and you're stuck into that particular circle is a form of idolatry. Even if you don't have a statue, you can have an, an, an idea. Just an idea. It doesn't have to be a statue. It can be an idea. All these things. And happen to say this just in case anyone does this. Reading, star, um, going to a tarot reader, a palm reader. Obviously, none of you do it here, alhamdulillah. But in other parts of the world, they do that. The Prophet sallallahu he said in the hadith, which is in Bukhari and Muslim and others, he said, مَنْ ذَهَبَ إِلَىٰ عَرَّافٍ أَوْ كَاهِنٍ uh, whoever goes to a fortune teller, so-called fortune teller, right, or a palm reader and, and the sorts, and believes in what they say, then they have disbelieved in what Allah has sent them. Open kufr. And whoever goes to them for fun and doesn't believe what they said, 40 days of their prayer will not be accepted because you are promoting this. This person is making business out of it. They're tricksters. It's an art of how they know Oh, they say to me, students, so, so, but what if it's true? Like the other day, they met. Guys, the Rasul said, The people who read stars, this is what they do, astrology, they read stars and they tell you future and things that they fluke it, right? They guess it, and it's an art. They are lying, even if they happen to um, 
fluke one or two correct things. And over a thousand people, they'll get five of them right, and those five will make the business for them. They'll tell another five, another five. It's not the thousand, like maybe 905 of them knew that they were liars. But that five, those are the people they're after. And this is how it happens, trickery. Anyway, brothers and sisters, they turned these five idols into gods, and they started to worship them outright. And disbelieved in Allah and any message of Idris and Adam. And for the first time, Allah sent the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. This, he was the first messenger of Allah to be sent to a people that committed shirk like they disbelieve now. This is kufr. Every, every sense of the word, open kafir, open disbeliever, rejecter of Allah and worshipping other deities other than God. Nuh alayhi salam was said to have sent to Babylonia. Some said he was in India. Others said uh, he was uh, close to the Turkey region. But the point is somewhere around there. Nuh alayhi salam, we don't know exactly. He was tall. He was wise. And Nuh alayhi salam is the second most narrated prophet to us in the Quran. The first prophet most narrated is Prophet Musa Prophet Nuh second most narrated. And you will find the majority of his story in Surah Hud and Surah Nuh. And there are other scattered places. The Quran repeats his story in different ways. Why is Nuh so important? Well, because he came to a people who did the most dangerous act that enters people into hellfire eternity. And there are so many lessons to be learned from that story from which idolatry developed. <coughs> Brothers and sisters in Islam, for this reason, the Prophet ﷺ said, angels do not enter a house. The hadith is in Sahih Muslim. Angels, لا تدخل الملائكة بيت لا تدخل الملائكة بيتا فيه كلب أو صور. The angels do not enter a home, a house, which has in it a dog or images of faces. And the angels, the dog is a nice animal. Allah I mean, a woman entered paradise for giving a dog water to drink. He forgave Allah's sin and he was the cause of her entering paradise. But the issue with the dog is its saliva is dirty and it's not good for a Muslim home. It's just filthy. So the angels don't like entering places that are filthy, like the toilet and the home that has a dog. And statues, because statues were made, it was the cause of idolatry. Now a person might ask, what about the photos that you take with the camera or with the iPhone, the phones? The ulama are split on that, and I rest on the opinion that they are halal, because you are taking a real image, like a reflection, and you're not making it into an image, but to be on the safe side, they said, pack them away. Don't display them. As for toys and things that kids play with, they're fine. So long as you don't display them as a design, and you just leave them there. The kids can play with toys. Rasul uh, once cut uh, a picture, a, a whole mat that had pictures on it, that was hung up on the wall by Aisha, radiallahu anha. He took it down, and he cut it into small pieces and made pillows, pillows and cushions out of it. And uh, he said, the, Aisha, the, the, nice, the angels do not enter a home that has images of pictures in it, but you're allowed to cut them up. And if there are bits and pieces here and there in, in, on your pillows or you sit on them or they're on the floor, it's okay. It's okay. So that covers that, inshallah. Nuh alayhi salam tried very hard. He is the first one to teach us the art of da'wah, the art of teaching people who are in, in the most diverse ways that you can approach people, whether it be public speaking, whether it be what I'm doing right now, whether it be you speaking to your family or friends, presenting something, talking to people, trying to convince, debating, uh, trying to sell something, trying to buy something. 
trying to present something, trying to explain something, right? Trying to convince people. Nuh alayhi salam was the first prophet to absolutely exhaust every avenue of communication you can think of. He was the art of that. And many ulama till today we learn, they learn from Nuh alayhi salam's art of da'wah. Da'wah, inviting, teaching, talking, everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an that Nuh alayhi salam was sent to this most stubborn and arrogant people. So imagine you are trying to communicate to the most stubborn, arrogant people on earth. And you use every diverse way for 950 years. And only about 10 is the lowest narration to 80, the, the highest number ever narrated, of people to believe in. No more than 80. 950 years he called them. In the most eloquent and, and, and amazing diverse way of communication that anyone could, could think of. And only a maximum of 80 people believed in him and followed him in a number of 950 years. And by the way, they lived long. So a lot of them lived 500, 600 years. Like they didn't even die and, and forget. They were still living with him. Allahu Akbar. And for this reason, Nuh alayhi salam becomes the first of the five most important prophets called Ulul Azm. Ulul Azm, the ones who persevered the most with their people. They persevered the most with their people and suffered the most from their people. They are five. Nuh alayhi salam is the first. The second is Ibrahim alayhi salam. The third is Jesus Christ, Isa alayhi salam. Before him is Musa alayhi salam, Moses. And then Jesus, Isa alayhi salam. And finally, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, Nuh alayhi salam was brought to his people like this. Allah says in the Quran, Inna arsalna Nuhan ila qawmihi an anzir qawmaka min qabli ayy. In Surah Nuh, Allah says, We have sent, we sent, verily we sent Nuh to his people. Every prophet was sent to his own people, except Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the rest of the world. To warn them, warn his people of their act before a punishment befalls them. And a painful punishment befalls them is on the day of judgment. In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Nuh alayhi salam, وَلَقَدَ أَرْسَلْنَا نُوحًا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ إِنِّي لَكُمْ نَذِيرٌ مُّبِينٌ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا اللَّهِ إِنِّي أَخَافُ عَلَيْكُمْ عَذَابَ يَوْمٍ أَلِيمٌ In Surah Hud, Allah says, And verily we sent Nuh to his people, and he said to them, I am to you a clear warner that you do not worship other than Allah alone. I fear upon you. I fear, I fear for you. Every prophet feared for his people, he was merciful. He says, I fear upon you a terrible punishment and a day which is painful, the day of judgment. They refused. They teased him. They mocked him. They tried to assassinate him. They propagated against him. They did all sorts of plots and plans to get rid of him. They bullied him. They isolated him. They ruined, they, they, they character assassinated him. In one hadith, I'm not sure of its authenticity, but its meaning is true. It says that a man would come who has a child who had lived for 500 years with him because they lived long. And he would point to Nuh, an old man, and he would say to his son, See this man? He is a crazy man. He's insane. Everybody knows him. 500 years been insane. Stay away from him. That's how people used to talk about Nuh. He was a messenger of Allah. La ilaha illallah. And he said in Surah Nuh, Qala Rabbi. He said, Oh my Lord, inni da'awtu qawmi laylan wa nahara. Oh my Lord, I called my people night and day. 
my invitation to them did not increase them in anything but more running away. And every time I called them to, for, to ask Allah to forgive them and for them to ask forgiveness for their sins, what would they do? They would bring their clothes and cover their ears with it. And they'll put their fingers into their ears and plug them so they don't hear me. And so Nuh salam started to use he started to use a sign language with them. He started to when they didn't hear, he used to sign language. That's not sign language, but I'm just I made up my own one. Sign language. So even the deaf people, you make da'wah to them. You teach them. There is a communication every way, shape or form. He said, I called them in public. Then I realized maybe some of them are embarrassed. Maybe their family who will kill them. Maybe their family will isolate them. Maybe their reputation. Maybe, maybe, maybe. So I went to them. Israra. I went to them in secret as well. I used to go and knock on their doors in private. Listen, I saw you in public over there. Maybe you believed, but you're just too embarrassed. Just tell me in secret. I will cover it. I will bear witness for you in Allah. Is there anything you want me to teach you? And they would still say, no, not even in secret. And this tells us the fuqaha, the ulama of, of religion, they say to us that if somebody you know, fears isolation and bullying from family and from the community or their reputation or whatever it may be, their job, then it's okay for them, it's alright for them to keep their Islam a secret if they want to convert. Islam a secret for a year or two or three or even ten years. Keep it a secret, it's fine if you're going to be harmed. But even that, the people of Nuh still rejected. Nuh tried every, every form. Tough, rough, easy, soft, nice, everything. And he tried to debate them. In the end, only 80 or so people followed him. And if it wasn't bad enough, those 80 people who followed him were from the lower class of the, of the whole nation. They were the lower class. They had, in their eyes, I'm not saying today, don't misunderstand. In their time, they looked down upon their job. And they were farmers. And in, to them, they were the lowest of the low. Their jobs were nothing. They were the lowest, they were the poorest, they were nobodies. SubhanAllah, Islam came to give everyone their value. You see at the time of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was a shepherd and a slave, he had no lineage. Look how he became right now. He is uh, one of the heroes of Islam till today. Isn't that amazing? A sauda, his wife, radiallahu anha, became the wife of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, also used to be a slave, lineage not known. Baraka ibn Mu'ayman. The one who first touched the Prophet and raised him, Allahu Akbar. All these people. There was once an old Ethiopian lady who used to clean the mosque, the masjid of the Prophet The hadith is sahih. I forgot where it is, but it's sahih. It's authentic. And she used to clean it. Nobody really cared much about her because she wasn't really known. One day the Prophet didn't see her around and he asked, where is she? They said, Ya Rasulullah, she died last night. He said, Allahu Akbar, why didn't you tell me? They said, Ya Rasulullah, we thought we wouldn't come and bother you. It was in the middle of the day, you were asleep. He said, you should have woken me up. Where is her grave? He put his cloak on and rushed to the grave by himself and prayed janazah on this woman. While he was crying, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahu Akbar, the best, message, the best man of Allah on the face of the earth, the best creature of Allah on the face of the earth, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, goes to honor and lift this woman who nobody else really you know, thought much of. Islam did not come to value people based on their job or their clothing or their color or their race or whether they're known or not known. Allahu Akbar. Once a man passed by the companions and he was wearing ragged clothing and he had he looked uh, like dust was on his face. He was sweating. He was working hard. And uh, a group of companions, they said, uh, Ya Rasulullah, if, if this man, this strong man would have used it in the cause of Allah rather than running around, you know, earning money and, and, and wealth and, and, and food for his family. Prophet ﷺ said, if this man is working to feed his family, it is fi sabidillah. If this man is working to provide himself so that he doesn't go and beg, it is fi sabidillah. And then he said, Rubbaha Maybe this 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 man that you see before you sweating with dust on his face because of hard work, 
لو أقسم على الله لا أبره. Maybe if he made one dua against you, Allah will accept it before yours. Don't ever put down people or speak low of them, no matter what their job or trade is. But these people, they put them down. And their value was, you are su- this, this supremacy thing. Whether it's your color or your, obviously it wasn't race, but it was about their job and how they are known. So they looked at these people and they said, Ya Nuh, you've been talking to us and arguing with us and debating with us. You debated us and you just debated too long. Five, six hundred, seven hundred years. وَمَا نَرَاكَ اتَّبَعَكَ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ هُمْ أَرَاذِلُنَا بَادِيَ الرَّأِي After all this time, all we see following you are the lowest of our people. بَادِيَ الرَّأِي They're primitive in their intelligence. All they know is farming and soil and cows and chicken and goats and sheep. Familiar words, aren't I? I'm saying familiar words. We say these things even till today. لَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ even though there are so many righteous and beautiful people, there are still those among us who need to learn, my brothers and sisters. They are primitive in their minds. They're fallahin, as some Arabs have said, they're just farmers. Even though in Australia, farmers are a big deal, right? <laughs> this is what I like about Australia. One thing, a few things actually, this is one of them, that, you know, it doesn't matter what trade you have, there's kind of this equality. Like, I mean, all right, they do it on the weekend, they all go and get... Some of them go get drunk, whether you're a lawyer, doctor, or whether you're a farmer, whatever you are, they do the same thing. But the thing is that, not all of them, but I'm just saying that everyone likes to have a good time, and everyone sort of acts equal, almost. So we cannot differentiate people because of their trade or their color or their race. Their intelligence could be far greater than our own, no matter what degree you have or whatever. So Allah, and as a teacher, I know that when we teach students, you know, school or university is not all the education of the world. You know, now I, I believe that in holidays they shouldn't get too much work because they learn more. They learn other things from the outside world than what they learn in schools. In Finland they have this. They say we want to play and learn from the outside world which we can't offer them in schools. So education and knowledge, brothers and sisters, is vast. And it's not just from textbooks or in the classroom. Brothers and sisters in Islam... They looked at them and they said they're farmers. It's like saying, oh, it's like today, say, excuse me for saying this, if I have any traders here, I'm not having a go at you, I respect them. But it's like saying a group of people come up and they've all got, you know, professional jobs in, in, in corporate jobs and they say, for example, for example, they say, well, is this man only traders go to the mosque? Why, did we, why, should, why should we become Muslim? We only see traders and, you know, other people who are uneducated. No, no, it's not. This is, education is, is, is that's not what they mean. I respect these people. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, the value and the character of a person is what is what values them or devalues them. If you lie, you're a thief, you're a steal, you don't stick by principles, you don't have values which you stick by. You're foul mouthed and you cheat people and you, you abuse people. That doesn't matter what degree you have or who you are. And these people, they look down upon them and they said, Oh, only these little farmers, low lies followed you? He said, Yes. They have a right, as you have a right to follow the truth. And Allah will reward them just like He'll reward you if you follow the truth. Allah will bring upon you, the sky will rain upon you with blessings. And in the hereafter, they said no. They said to him, if those peasants, they call them peasants, if those peasants leave you, we will follow you. We don't want to mix with them. And inshallah, next week, we will continue with the reply of Nuh alayhi salam, and then what happens next. Thank you for listening, because the share is now coming, coming to time. Jazakumullahu khayr. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.